just a big Charleston contest. I am uh, Stefano. I am an Italian man. You've reached the house of unrecognized talent. Uh, where do you stand on independence, Dr. Hall? I'm here without instructions, Mr. Hughes. Able to vote my own personal convictions. Uh, Dr. Hall, the deep south speaks with one voice. It's traditional. Even more, it is historic. Domo arigato, Mr. Scotto. And welcome back to the Brooklyn's Dad Talks About Everything podcast. This is your humble host, Michael Scotto, in the great state of North Carolina. That's right, the home of Joseph Hughes, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Today on the podcast, we talk about tradition, we talk about Lent, and we talk about the Gold Covenant again. We take a look at that, we look at all those things in context, some of the things we've just been talking about, and some of the stuff that's going on in the world today. Meaning, it's that time of year again, it's Lent, baby. So let's take a look at it. Come on. And why do we do these things? Because it's a tradition. That's why we do a lot of things. Uh, it's time for me to talk again that time of year. I'm going to pause from our, pause from our study on walking through the scripture and just talk about Lent. I forgot. I almost forgot it was Lent until I saw all the pictures of Christians fawning over politicians and actors who have the ashes on their forehead for Ash Wednesday. That would include Joe Biden, who never met an abortion he didn't want you to pay for, and he didn't celebrate Anyway, I'm just going to briefly look at this. I may have looked at this in the past, but it, it's worth revisiting because it kind of represents a lot of other things. First of all, if you do Lent, that's fine. I'm not here to tell you to do or not do anything. I'm just telling you, if you're doing it, it's just your choice to do it. it it's not biblical. <laughs> it's not commanded of the Lord in any way, particularly for this age. Certainly not for this age, really. So, but even, you know, you're in good company, uh, Christianity Today, the Alabama Baptist, newspapers, magazines, publications, websites, they call Lent one of the oldest Christian traditions. Well, good, whoop de doo it's an old tradition, I don't know that it's Christmas, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how Christian it is, talking about Christmas, I love Christmas, but I don't do the religious side of it, really. So, um, and, and that Alabama Baptist article, by the way, the they lament in that article that not all Southern Baptist churches participate in Lent activities. Now, again, the way the Southern Baptist Church is set up, churches are fairly autonomous. They have to, there's a, there's a standard statement of faith, and then they can vary on a lot of other things, like Calvinism versus dispensationalism. It can depend on the local church, a local pastor, etc. That has its own problems, but we'll, we can leave that for another time. But again, and that's, I've been out of the Southern Baptist Church for a while now. So, I mean, things may have changed. They might all do it now. I mean, people, Christians, when they run out of Bible, they love tradition. You know, how do these things get started? Well, they get started at some point, oftentimes taken from pagan practices. Now, one of the things I say on here, and I'll use this as an aside, one of the things I say in here is things are from Greek mythology. Now, when I talk about Greek mythology, a lot of the world's mythology and a lot of the world's false religions came from original truths. They were just perverted over time. So when you see some things in Greek mythology, if you study them, you can see where they were a perversion of that which may have been true. Same thing in other religions, like the story of Gilgamesh, you know, and the, the multiple stories of the flood in all these different cultures that aren't connected to each other. It's actually an evidence for the flood, not an evidence against the flood, and Noah. But anyway, they're all versions and perversions of the the original so that's true now also i mean it's infiltrated a lot of places and it's infiltrated believers as well uh lent was formalized at the council of nicaea 8325 pope gregory he's writing to augustine and he said this we abstain from flesh meat and from all things that come from flesh as milk cheese and eggs Second, the general rule for a person to have one meal a day in the evening or at 3 p.m. Okay, so that's how it started. Right? If you really want to do Lent, and that, I'm, I'm quoting that from CatholicEducation.org. And again, I, I, go to, I go to sources. I don't go to, I go to Catholic sources. I'm going to talk about the Catholic Church. I go to Orthodox sources that talk about Orthodoxy. I go to Baptist sources if I want to talk about Baptists. I don't want to speak out of turn for them. But then they evolved, they said. 
All right, Catholic education says it evolved. Lenten fasting rules evolved. Eventually, it's it's no longer every day. It's no longer you have to eat after 3 p.m. It's, you know, milk, cheese, and eggs and those things and all these things you probably recognize that you don't recognize today. But again, these things over time changed. But the reason these things happen is simple. It's what we've talked about a billion, jillion times. They're not satisfied with Scripture. And we talked about this even in the context of evangelicals and evangelical seminaries, even the hardcore reform seminaries. They talk about Sola Scriptura, but they love their catechisms. They love their church confessions. They love their early church fathers. Right? They love the councils to one degree or another. They love their catechisms. That, those are the things that just permeate, permeate the faith from the outside and Scripture, too. But Paul said at the very early and again, this, we're talking about 325 AD, AD 325, which again, people say, well, that's old. It's, it, it, it's old. It's older than you. How do you know? They know. They know. Well, here's what Paul wrote. Paul said in Acts 20, even before the end of the book of Acts, he said, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves come in and enter among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Acts 20. And we know Paul, his last epistle, 2 Timothy, he talks about all those in Asia having abandoned him. Now, they didn't abandon Christ, necessarily, but they abandoned Paul, who was the apostle who was sent to them. But here, even in the book of Acts, when we have that church, not even called the early church because it's that gathering, that calling, that hope. They're hoping for the kingdom. Acts 1 6. Talked about that a million times. But he said, even after Paul leaves, when it comes to the doctrine specifically of life, how to have resurrection life, how to be reconciled to God through Christ, that grievous wolves would enter in as soon as Paul left, not sparing the flock as believers. And of your own selves shall men arise. Right? We saw that actually when we, we looked at. Uh, Titus before, and the mouths that must be stopped, they come in the name of Christ, they come in the name of Paul, they come in the name of the apostles, right? but we have to stand up against that. God's dealings change with men over time, but it's always found in Scripture, and it's confirmed by the Word. So now we go to God questions. This is the evangelical side, so now I'll talk about evangelicals, sort of my people for the most part. <laughs> I consider myself an evangelical. Saved by grace through faith. And here's what gotquestions.org says. Quote, The rules that Catholics cannot eat meat on Fridays during Lent is actually more lenient than what most Catholics in history have had to observe. Centuries ago, the Catholic Church had a law that forbade consuming meat on Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. Later, this rule was relaxed to remove meat from the diet on Ash Wednesday and all Fridays. 1966, Catholic bishops in America, with the blessing of Pope Paul VI, further relaxed the rule nowadays meat is only prohibited on Ash Wednesday. Good Friday and the Fridays of the Lenten season. Catholics are obligated to observe this fast as a minimum. That's true, because I grew up in that. That's what I was taught and what I taught as a Catholic teacher. And what I taught was taught in Catholic school and in CCD classes. And what it says, it's very clear. It's very known to most Catholics. Now, if you eat a piece of meat, you're not going to go to hell. But if you willingly say, I'm going to eat this piece of meat because I don't care, because I don't care that it's Good Friday, then you're in trouble, right? So, again, it's all denial of Christ. This all takes the focus off of the finished work of Christ. I mean, this is all during the Easter season, which is incredible. Again, I don't do the holidays, uh, but the Easter season, which is supposed to be a celebration of the resurrection, uh, you people spend all their time not eating chocolate for 40 days or you know, being nice to their neighbor for four, whatever it is. You know, Jesus you know, was falsely accused, beaten, whipped, nailed to a cross, suffered, gave up the ghost, went to the grave, didn't decay, and rose from the dead by the power of God and is now glorified in heaven. And I gave up chocolate for 40 days. I mean, it really it really is an insult. I'm sorry. I know people do it. You can do it. I just, I just can't imagine. Now, again, I'm not against, if you want to do it as some sort of reminder, you know, I don't know, whatever you want to do, that's your business. I just, it just, to me, I, I I just don't see any value in it. And I think these 
things that people want to participate in is because they're not satisfied with Scripture. I know that's a broad statement, but uh, that's just what I feel. Because I was very religious. I loved Lent. I loved holidays. I loved not eating meat on Fridays. And I've shared here before that I there was actually one year I actually I always screwed up somehow. <laughs> And I got all the way to Good Friday, and I hadn't eaten meat on any Friday, and or Ash Wednesday. And then I was in the refrigerator, and I just, my mother had gotten some fresh meat from the deli, and I picked a piece of ham, shoved it in my mouth as I was looking. I was like, I can't believe I just ate some meat. Now, I didn't do it purposely, so I'm not going to burn it. I wasn't going to burn it. I wasn't going to burn it anyway, but you know what I mean. So anyway, here's how I have described it. And this is Michael's bullet list of how these things come to be. Something doesn't exist. Some guy makes it up. Yeah, some some religious thing. So now it gets older over time. A lot of fighting and squabbling is exactly what it means, exactly what the boundaries are. We saw that. We started off no milk or cheese or anything on any day, no eating three o'clock or in the evening time, that sort of thing. But then once those things kind of get settled and people die. <laughs> but anyway, it gets older and now it's settled in. So now it's ancient truth, ancient truth. People forget that everybody argued about it. And then everybody forgets they argued about it, and they also forget that somebody made it up in the first place. And now, because it's ancient, people assume that it's true. Also along those lines is that when Augustine comes along and he's writing what he's writing, or anybody comes along and writing what, what they're writing, I mean, even people I like, John Darby or Bullinger, I'm sure if you went to Augustine and said, do you realize that what you wrote people consider infallible, and if they don't agree with you 100%, they're liable to be excommunicated? and in some doctrines, lose their life in Christ because they disagree with you or Origen, you know, or whomever, Nazianzus. <laughs> Those people like Augustine, I'm sure would be like, that's insane. People are free to, I'm not infallible. People can disagree with me. I mean, John Darby certainly felt like that, and E.W. Bollinger did. But no matter who you have, John, Calvin or Luther, I suppose if those people ever thought that things they wrote down were going to be on par with Scripture, no, they would be horrified. They would be horrified. You know, that well, we believe that because John Calvin said it, or because Luther said it. Now, you can believe it. You know, maybe you agree with their interpretation. But the truth is confirmed in Scripture. And, and it's a personal conviction through study and comparison and prayer. I, I don't know why, again, getting back to the evangelical source, why God questions, they support Lent. I mean, they're giving you this history of it, and right in, in reading it directly from them, they should sit back and go, wait a minute, this is all made up, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Maybe we're wasting our time. Maybe we're drawing away from Christ or Scripture by doing these things. Again, I would fall back to Colossians 2.16 here, too. Let no man judge you in regard to a holy day or feast, etc. there in Colossians 2. It's a very powerful chapter. You know, they did practice during the book of Acts because it was, they were expecting the kingdom, the Passover. That's what the Lord's Supper is. It's the Passover meal. That's what it says it is. Even when the Lord institutes it. You know, yeah, I, sh I share this Passover with you, etc. So these are the rudiments of the world. They have to do with the world. Even, even the real stuff like Passover, which is a real biblical feast of Israel. You know, even that... Even baptism, which is a ritual washing of the priesthood. And we talked about the priesthood last time. That we don't have a priesthood. We're not a priesthood. Otherwise, we're priests for whom? We say, the dad is the priest for the family. Well, where'd you get that? Well, what Peter says, we're a royal priesthood. Yes, because Peter was preaching. <laughs> Peter was sent to circumcision during the book of Acts. Right? So this is how everything becomes consistent. Right? That's what Peter was. Peter, Peter wrote, to the dispersion. Right to the dispersion. That's those are Jews. That's the Jewish dispersion. I mean, nobody can more be more clear than James. To the twelve tribes scattered abroad. I mean, how more clear could he be? And in Second Peter, Peter says to refers to those that I wrote to previously. The dispersion. Those are Jews. The dispersion. It's a you know part of Jewish history, and it's scattered abroad. The twelve tribes scattered abroad. And the twelve tribes aren't lost. The ten tribes aren't lost. James found them. Well, on James, let me just talk about James 2, because we talked about bearing false witness yesterday, or last time, yesterday for me, <laughs> whenever you hear this. We talked about bearing false witness, and we talked about, have you any Jews in your basement? And uh, you can not tell the truth there, because that's not the intent of that law, even for Israel. Well, when James talks about faith without works is dead, in chapter 2, First of all, there he, he writes to 
in Greek, the synagogue. The synagogue. When you come into your synagogue in that chapter, first part of that chapter. Now, that's the only place where it's not translated synagogue because they didn't know what to do with it. So they turned it into assembly or church or meeting or something in the English translations. But everywhere else it's synagogue because that's what it is. They were meeting in synagogues. They were Jews. In that chapter, later on, he talks about faith without works is dead. He gives two examples. One is Abraham that we talked about, who took Isaac, and the specific, specific example he gives of Abraham's faith. Now, Abraham was already declared righteous earlier, we're told, by Paul. He believed God, and it was counted in him for righteousness. Before this happened, this is an act which attests to his faith. It doesn't make his faith real. It attests to it. But anyway, but what is that act? is taking his son to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. And then God stops him, of course, and supplies a ram, a great picture of Christ as a substitute, and a giving of the son, you know, the sacrifice of the son. So is that what we're going to do? To to prove my faith, I have to take my son to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him? I mean, mean, that's the the works you're talking about? That's not volunteering at the the food shelter, the food pantry at the local shelter. Right. This is, but there's a specific act that can only be explained because earlier he believed God and was counted on him for righteousness. The other one, the other example that is given, which is more fascinating, which is a wonderful character in Scripture, is the character of Rahab. She was the harlot in Jericho. And when the spies went into Jericho, she hid them. She hid the spies. When they came to her and she was hiding them, they asked her, are you hiding the spies? <laughs> Basically. And she or false witness. And she said, no, 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 they went down, they went down at rope, see that rope, they're gone. Right? And so because of that, God rewarded her. Now, that's another example given by James of a fa- of faith without works is dead. Now, again, this is all in the Jewish context, but still. So the two examples we have is human sacrifice of your child and lying, bearing false witness. So that really, we want to say, are the works that make you get saved. No, of course not. But Rahab, she showed her faith. She displayed her faith in protecting God's spies in Jericho. She committed treason against her own people. But of course, she is also then later in the line of David, this harlot, God's grace. And because she's in the line of David, that means what else? She's in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. She's one of only three women that are mentioned you know, Bathsheba, that's adultery. Rahab. And then, of course, even uh, Judah. Judah who commits adultery. So that's mentioned. So you have these this picture of grace where the Lord intervenes. But Rahab is a great character in Scripture. And Rahab hid the spies. It's a great moment in Jewish history, well, Israeli history, of the Israelites. All that to say that that's getting back to the priesthood that I was talking about previously. So when you say the, the dad is the priest of the family, what's that? Where's that from? Dad isn't the priest of the family. Every believer is his own priest, right? But then priests for whom? Same thing we asked when we got back to, you shall be a kingdom of priests, a nation of priests. Priests for whom? They're all going to be around running priests for each other? Now they had a, a one tribe that was chosen to be the earthly priesthood at the time for the other tribes. But all of Israel were to be a nation of priests, if they obey. They didn't obey, that's why God had to pull out this other priesthood and set up the sacrificial system, because they failed initially. And then, as soon as they failed, he didn't go back to the beginning. He gave them a picture of Christ, all the sacrifices, pictures of Christ. So this was the evidence for them, because it says, foretold that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. But Jesus Christ, this one man having sacrificed himself one time for sins, sat down forever at the right hand of God. Because the work was complete in Christ, one sacrifice. But the others were just pictures. But the idea was, before the, law, before the Ten Commandments were even given, before the law that was given, the covenant itself said that you shall be a kingdom of priests, a nation of priests. For whom? For the nations. Because God speaks of the nations, the Gentiles, believing Gentiles. He speaks of them. We see them in Nineveh. We see them coming down from Syria. We see them in the Lord's ministry, with the centurion and the Canaanite woman. We see all these Gentile believers. And in the kingdom on earth, Israel is to be their priesthood. Now we see that in the prophets. Zechariah said, the day is coming. 
future, future, future. Day is coming when a Gentile will grab the shirt of a Jew and say, take me to God. Now, this is why in the kingdom, some Gentiles, the faithful ones, will come and sit down and dine with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the sons of the kingdom, it says, the Lord says in Matthew, sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing their teeth. Well, why are they weeping and why are they gnashing their teeth? Because they were in the kingdom, they had an inheritance as the sons of Abraham, and they are cast out. Because they were not good servants. We see that later on when we see the weeping and gnashing teeth. They were not faithful servants. But they're still servants. They just weren't profitable servants. They were unprofitable servants. So they're cast in the outer darkness. That's not hell. That's not burning. That's out amongst the nations. They can no longer, they lost their inheritance. As Paul says in Galatians, talked about that. You will lose your inheritance. Those who walk in the flesh, you have the, have those who walk in the spirit, walk according to the spirit, walk according to the flesh. Love, joy, peace in the spirit and then the works of the flesh. And so if you walk in the flesh in that age, you'll lose your inheritance, Paul says. And you're not going to lose your life. It's a free gift, but you will lose your inheritance. So now these things all start to make sense. So what we don't do in this age is start to lose sight of our hope, which is the heavenly hope in the far above the heavens where Christ sitteth at the right hand of the Father. And we can do that by getting hung up on earthly traditions like Lent. And Good Friday, which she wasn't even crucified on a Friday. We've covered that before. It wasn't three crosses anyway. It was five crosses. We had a message on that. Go look for that one. Th five crosses, not three. All right. Again, these aren't disqualifying anybody from salvation, of course. None of that is. But if, if, we, want to, if we want to truly try to serve God according to his will for this age, we have to ab abide by God's revelation for this age. Again, even the most Torah-keeping pretend Torah-keeping Christian who loves to say Yahweh and Yeshua, even that they don't obey the law, and they know they don't obey the law. Because they'll tell you that part of it's been, you know, they don't go to the temple in Jerusalem anymore because they'll say that was satisfied in Christ. Yes, that makes you a dispensationalist. There's, I would say there's a word for that. It starts with dispen and ends with sationalist. Even the most hardcore reformed I'll say, well, you're not going to Jerusalem to sacrifice an animal. No, that's over with. Yeah, there's a word for God doing one in something in one age and not in another age. For one people, but not for another people. <laughs> it's called, starts with a disband and ends with a sensationalism. <laughs> right? Sensationalism, that's all it is. It's just economies. Even when, in, when Jonah goes to Nineveh, he doesn't go to Nineveh and set up a priestly system and tell them they have to come to Jerusalem every year. He doesn't say that. He goes around, around the city and preaches against the wickedness that's even wicked for Gentiles. We're not even under the law. But as we talked about going back to Adam and then Cain and those in the days of Noah, without the law, they were still wicked in their conscience. Now the law comes along and what, is, what does it say about the law? Well, the law makes sin even worse. It makes sin more sinful because now it's specific. You're specifically disobeying God, right? Not just in your conscience, not doing what you know is wrong. Now you're specifically disobeying God. That's what makes sin more sinful makes wickedness, wickedness more wicked. That's the role of the law. The law can only condemn. The law makes nothing perfect, Scripture says. It purifies nothing. It's good and holy. Sure it is. Thou shalt not kill is good and holy. <laughs> but it's not going to make you pure by just walking around not killing. <laughs> it's not going to make, not going to give you life by just walking around not killing. And then the Lord even takes it further by saying, if you, you murder in your heart, you commit adultery in your heart with your eyes, so and all that does, all those extra things even the Lord added, all it does is make wickedness more wicked. Makes us more dependent upon Christ. Makes his grace even greater. Grace that is greater than all my sin. So we're going to stop there. We started in Lent. We ended up back in the law, but that's good. Because we need to cover those things again. So until next time, just look to the Lord. Look to the Lord. Don't get hung up on, on earthly traditions. And just look to the Lord. And read his word, particularly the last seven epistles of Paul. If you want to start, read Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians. Ephesians, Colossians, and Philippians. Meditate, particularly on chapter 3 of Ephesians. The revelation given to Paul and Rome for the city. Alright, so until next time, bye bye.